You know, today, as we begin this new series that I'm going to be teaching over the next few weeks, uh, I'm calling it Christmas Gifts. And I don't know about you, but Christmas is a wonderful time to me. I love uh, giving gifts. I love receiving gifts. I love just the whole idea of, of gifts. My daughter, Ashley, is probably one of the best gift givers. Um, I say that because she's not the person that, like gives you a gift on the day that you're supposed to get a gift. She's the person that notices something that you need and she'll just surprise you. She'll just say, hey, I bought this for you because I was thinking about you. I saw that you needed it. And, and it's always something that you need. My wife, Angela, packs our lunch uh, every day when we come to work. And this past week, uh, she actually, the lunchbox that she had, uh, had kind of gotten something in it and it smelled bad. And Angela's like, I don't know what happened. She threw it away. And the next day, Ashley shows up at the house with this little bag for Angela. And she says, Mom, I noticed that yours was thrown away. And so I got you a lunchbox. And it was kind of cool because Angela wasn't expecting. She was like, Ashley, that was so thoughtful. Thank you so much uh, for getting that for me. Now, if you don't know my daughter, Ashley, I would encourage you to become her friend because she'll give you a great gift. I'm just <laughs> telling you, she's, she's a great gift giver. But when Angela opened this, there were like these little containers that Ashley had bought. Uh, and, and the containers basically, uh, you know, help put everything together the way it's supposed to be. And so she's explaining to Angela. And I was just sitting there watching Angela, like, you know, just with a smile on her face, so excited about getting this gift. And then I just thinking to myself, you know, it's a gift that gives gifts, right? I mean, like there's gifts on the inside. And as I was thinking about that, I started thinking about Christmas. And I thought to myself, you know, isn't that like God? God gave us the gift of Christ. And in receiving the gift of Christ, there are other gifts that we are continually getting and receiving in our life. It's a gift that continues to give. And so over the next few weeks, what I want to do is talk about some of the different gifts that we have in Christ. And as we're kind of going through this Advent season, hoping to prepare your heart for the Christmas, for the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the celebration of His birth, you know, Christmas is a wonderful time. And, and as I'm, I'm thinking about these gifts, I, I thought about God giving the greatest gift that could ever be given. In fact, in John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son that everyone who believes in him will not, have, um, will not perish but have eternal life. So in Christ, we have eternal life. God gave the greatest gift that could ever be given. His son coming to earth, him being born in a manger, him giving or, or living a sinless, perfect life and then dying for our sins so that we could be connected with God, that we could have eternal life, the greatest gift that could ever be given. And then I started thinking to myself about Christmas and how each of us want different things at Christmas. In fact, let me just ask you this question because I was asking this question to some friends this week. What would you wish for if you knew that you would truly get it at Christmas? What would you wish for if you knew what you or you knew that you would truly get it at Christmas? What would be the thing that you would wish for? And I think every one of us have different things that that like immediately go into our head. If I knew that I was going to get it, what would be the one thing uh, that I would wish for? And as I talk to different people, here's some things that people would say. Some people would say, you know what? I would wish for money, right? I would wish for money. I need X number of dollars. And that's not bad. It solves problems. It can save time. But it doesn't always equal happiness. And then others would say something like, you know, if you're single, I, I, I wish I could get a spouse. I'd love to get married. And let me just say this. Married is not a bad goal. It's a, it's a good thing. But it's good until it's not good, right? For those that are married. Like, it's something that you might be wishing for. It's something that you think in your life, hey, I really would want that. But then others of you, you might say, you know, I just wish I could have happiness. And, and happiness is not a bad goal. It's based on happening in circumstances, right? Oftentimes in our life. And other people would say something like, I wish I could have beauty, but let me just remind you that it will eventually fade. That's what the Song of Solomon tells us. And then others would say, maybe I, I would want health. I, I, I would hope that I could have better health this year. And, and listen, health is good, but it passes away too, right? And, and it fades on us. And, and is that true uh, about life? And see, oftentimes when you ask somebody what they want, they know what they want, but they don't always know what they need. And there's a big difference. 
And one of the things that I love about God is that God gives to us what we need. He gives us something that is far greater than what we just want. And this, and, and what I want to do uh, today is I want to talk about this gift of peace that God gives to us. This gift that not only we can experience during the holiday season, but a gift that we can have throughout the year in our lives. In Luke chapter 2, verse 14, it says this, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. And the angels announce the birth of Jesus. And they tell us that there is going to be peace on earth because of the coming of Christ. And so Jesus, in his ministry, would often say to people when he was with them or when he would meet them, he would say, peace be with you. Or sometimes he would say, go in peace. That's the words that Jesus would use. Paul, in writing uh, in the New Testament, he says, grace and peace be with you, oftentimes when he opens his letters uh, to the individuals that he's writing to. But notice what Paul did not say. Paul did not say, grace and popularity be with you. He didn't say, grace and power be with you. He didn't say, grace and riches be with you. He didn't say, grace and TikTok fame, right? He didn't say that. He said, grace and peace. Peace. I want you to think about that just for a moment. I would say to you what most people really need in their life today is peace. And I think if they really understood the need of their life, they would say, man, the thing that I need more than anything else is I need peace. And wouldn't you agree with me that in this time of the year, peace is a difficult thing for us to experience because life gets busy and we got all the things going on for Christmas that need to take place, all the parties, all the gifts that have to be bought, all the things that we have to do. And oftentimes, rather than having peace, what we have is we have anxiety and stress and we don't experience this peace that Jesus promised that we could have and this peace that would come into our life. And the peace that I'm going to talk about today is a peace that the world does not understand. It's a peace that if you're not a follower of Jesus, uh, you can't explain it or understand it. It's a peace that comes from heaven. It's a peace that is divine. It's a peace that only God can give to us. And that's exactly what Jesus wants us to know and to understand. Did you know that you can have money in the bank and not have peace in your heart? It doesn't mean that you're going to have peace. You can be successful on the outside, but you feel empty inwardly inside of your heart. You can be here today and be married and not have peace in your life uh, because, you know, you're constantly fighting with each other. There's conflict in your life. There's anxiety because of your relationship. You can be here today and be single and feel tension because you want more than what you have. And we want peace. But oftentimes, if we're honest, we experience the opposite of peace. We have fear and anxiety that we experience in our life on a daily basis. And sometimes even tension uh, that we go through in our lives. And in your relationships that you have, with your friends and with your family, if you were honest today, isn't it true that we want peace, but often we have the opposite of peace in those relationships? And what we experience, rather than experiencing peace, is we have misunderstandings among us or with each other, or we have disagreements. And so it's difficult for us to sit in a room together or to sit at a table and to uh, have fellowship with one another. Or we got hurt feelings, right? Somebody said something last year and someone's feelings were hurt and that's never really been dealt with. There is no peace inside of our home. Or you have unforgiveness or bitterness or anger. And what you really want in life is you want peace. You say, man, if we could just be around the table this year and all those misunderstandings and disappointments and things that were said. I mean, if we could just have peace as a family, that would be beautiful. If we could just have peace in our relationship with each other. If we could just experience that peace in our life. And so today, what I want to do for the next few moments is look into the book of Isaiah chapter 26, verses 1 through 4. And I want us to talk about where we can find this peace. And how you and I can get this peace in our life this year. And before we do, I'm going to ask you if you would to pray with me. And I want to ask the Holy Spirit to open our hearts to what he's going to say. Father, we want peace. Father, we need peace. And the gift you give us during this holiday season is peace that comes from Christ. 
And we thank you that in the life of Jesus, we uh, know that through him we can experience peace. He promises to give us peace. And so, Father, I pray in these next few moments, your Holy Spirit would just simply teach us that you would truly help us to experience peace before we leave this place today. For we pray in Jesus' name. In Isaiah chapter 26, I want to kind of set the context for you. Isaiah basically uh, is in a season of fear, and he, uh, or a season of fear and unsettledness. And as he's writing to this group of believers, he basically says this. He prophesies that a day of unbridled worship filled with peace, passion, and worship is going to come. And I want you to listen to what he says because he tells us about this perfect peace. He says, in that day, everyone in the land of Judah will sing this song. Our city is strong. We are surrounded by the walls of God's salvation. Open the gates to all who are righteous and allow the faithful to enter. He says, you will keep in perfect peace. There's the words. I want you to look at your neighbor and say perfect peace. If you're online, I want you to just type that in. Say perfect peace. Now think about that just for a moment. Perfect peace. All who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Trust in the Lord always, for the, uh, the Lord God is the eternal rock. You see, Isaiah says there is a perfect peace that God wants to give to us. And I don't know about you, but I need that peace in my life. I want to be able to experience this peace that he's talking about. I love this promise that Isaiah gives to us. I need this promise that Isaiah speaks over us. And I want to experience this promise in my life. And I want you to experience it this year in your life. I don't want Christmas to just come and to go. But I want it to be a time where you deeply reflect and you experience the presence of God in a way that maybe you've never experienced it before. That in all of the busyness and everything that's going on, that you will truly experience peace in your life. He says you will be kept in perfect peace. Now think about that. Perfect peace. I love that word like when you say it. Perfect peace. I don't know about you, but in my life, I'm more familiar with imperfect peace, right? I mean, oftentimes, I, I want peace in my life, and I have moments where I experience peace, probably just like you. I'll be going through the day, and things are kind of peaceful, but then all of a sudden, something happens, and immediately, where there was peace, now all of a sudden, there's anxiety, there's worry, uh, there's, there's frustration, right? Right? And we all go through that in our life. And I'm sure that many of you in the same way, maybe you're going through the day and you've got these moments where you experience peace and you're thinking to yourself, man, I'm, I'm so glad that I have peace in my heart. But then immediately something happens and there's worry and there's fear and there's anxiety that wells up on the inside of us. And I want the perfect peace that he talks about. Keep, or, or he uses the word kept in perfect peace. Now, what does that mean? Kept in perfect peace. If you go back to the original Hebrew language in which the Old Testament was written in, the word there is the word shalom. It means this. It means wholeness. It's the idea of completeness. It's the concept of the fullness of peace. In fact, the Jewish greeting often was, when you'd see someone, you would say shalom. And simply what you were saying is, may God's peace be upon you. May you be at peace with God May you be at peace with others. May you be at peace with yourself. And then may you be at peace with your circumstances. And that was the idea of shalom. Peace be upon you or peace be with you was the concept. And the original Hebrew word Isaiah basically says this. He says, be kept in shalom, shalom. It's actually a word that is said twice. It's the idea of peace on top of peace. Now, just let that resonate in your mind for just a moment because that's what Isaiah was saying. He was saying, may you have peace upon peace. The word shalom appears twice. It's an emphatic statement in the original Hebrew language. And what he's saying is, is could, can God give you a double portion or may you experience a double portion of peace? And so he comes to you and he comes to me and he says to us, hey, may God keep you in perfect peace. Shalom, shalom. Now, peace doesn't mean that you won't have troubles in your life. 
You see, oftentimes when people hear peace, they think, well, that just means I'll never have problems. I'm never going to have trials or troubles that come up in my life. And in our last series, we talked about that. Jesus said, in this world, you are going to experience troubles. There's going to be trials, there's going to be tribulations, there's going to be pain, there's going to be times that your football team loses, right? He says, you're not always going to have peace in your your heart because there are going to be problems. But in the middle of all of those problems, in the middle of all the troubles that you face, God can give you peace. There's a peace that you can experience. And you see, so many of us, we think, oh, well, peace means I'm never going to have any problems. You know, peace means the kids are always going to get along, right? They're never going to fight with each other. I hear somebody laughing like, yes, that's exactly right. That, that Marty, that'll never happen in my house, right? And then some of you, you're thinking to yourself, I mean, it means that me and my spouse are never going to fight, that everything's going to be perfect among us. We're always going to be at peace. Everything is going to be great. And don't look at them right now because there won't be peace when you get home today, all right? But the reality is that so many of us, we want peace, right? We want to experience peace. And he promises that we can experience peace. But it doesn't mean that we're not going to have problems. So here's the bottom line today, the one thought that I want to talk about for the next few moments. Peace isn't found in the absence of problems. True peace is found in the presence of God. Let me say that again because I think it's important. Peace isn't found in the absence of problems. You see, that's what most of us want. We just want the absence of problems, thinking that it will give us peace, but it really won't. True peace is found in the presence of God. You see, it's when we experience God. Uh, You know, you may be here today, and let me just say this. God wants you to be able to experience peace in your life. Peace just simply means this. It means not only God's presence, but God's perspective, right? God's perspective, but not only God's perspective, God's assurance. When I'm at peace, I have God's perspective about things, about circumstances and situations in life, but I also have God's assurance, knowing that he is with me, knowing that he has made promises to me. And see, peace, sometimes you think to yourself, I, there is no peace in my life, right? You may, be, you may be here today and maybe you felt betrayed. Maybe your body hurts. Maybe you're in pain. Maybe you're sick. Maybe you have bills that need to be paid and you're wondering how all that's going to happen. And because of everything that you're experiencing in your life right now, there is no peace in your heart. And you're thinking to yourself, how can you say that there can be peace? Let me make a statement that I think is important. The battle for peace begins in our minds. You see, it's, it's something that we battle inside of our minds. And that's where the battle is. Do any of you have the same problem that I have? Like, that's the war for me, is the battle that's in my mind, right? Because I know what God says. I want God's perspective. But oftentimes, as I think about what God says, and I'm trying to understand from God's perspective, my mind's telling me something completely opposite right? And so there's this battle that goes on inside of our brain, this battle that we fight. Believing what God says is sometimes hard for me. I don't know about you, but I I mean, one moment I can be saying, okay, I trust God. I know he's got this. And the next moment I'm crying out, God, where are you? And what are you doing? Right? And there's this battle that constantly goes on in my head where I'm fighting what I know God says. uh, And it's hard for me to understand what he says. Isaiah 26 verse three in the new living translation. I want to go back and read it again. It says, you will be kept in perfect peace. All whose thoughts are fixed on you. So it says, when our thoughts are fixed on him, there is a perfect peace that comes. In the NIV, it says it this way. You will be kept, or you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast. What is he saying? What is the the idea that he's trying to get across to us? He's saying that when your mind is fixed, when your mind is focused on God, there is a perfect peace that will come in your hearts. It's all about our minds being fixed on something, right? And and so I want you to think about that because all of us, our minds are fixed on something. For some of you, it's CNN. For some of you, it's Fox News, okay? I got conservatives and liberals in there, okay? I got both, both groups. But what is your mind fixed on? 
If it's constantly fixed on CNN and Fox News, guess what? No peace. Right? Somebody said, wow, Pastor Marty, you're bright. No, listen to me. (laughs) You can't have peace and watch that all day. He says your mind has to be fixed on God. Think about this. Where is your mind fixed on? Social media? Drama? Future? Problems? Bad news from your doctor? I mean, maybe problems that you're facing in your life? He says as long as you're focused on that and you're not focused on God, you're not going to have peace in your heart. And see, it's the focus. That's what Isaiah is telling us. If we will fix our mind on God, then we will be able to experience peace. I love the word there, fixed. It's a word, samak, in the original Hebrew language. And it just simply means this, to lean on completely, to fully rest oneself. The idea that Isaiah is making is this. He's saying that when you lean, like if I was to lean on this podium, right? If I lean on it, it holds me up. And he said, your mind is to be fixed on God in such a way that you are leaning on him, that you are trusting in him. You're fixing your mind and your thoughts on him and not all the other things. And so let me just ask you, what is your mind fixed on today? Somebody sitting here, maybe say, well, that cute girl or that cute guy that I was looking at, right? No, I'm not talking about that. What is your mind fixed on today? What consumes your mind? What does your mind drift to when maybe you're just sitting by yourself? Where does your mind go? That's really what he's trying to say to us. What does your mind focus on immediately in your life? And isn't it true? Like if you're like me, I know that my mind can go to my financial worries or political divisions. Or it can be uh, focused on wars and rumors of wars and things that are going on. And if I'm not careful, my mind doesn't drift towards God. My thoughts are not constantly fixed on him. And so if you're like me, all of a sudden your mind starts going towards things like what's going wrong. Or sometimes if you're like me, I think about what could go wrong, right? Like, like what could happen? Like what might happen? And so you get fixed on those things. And then all of a sudden you begin to find yourself looking towards those things. And, and you're, 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 you start experiencing dread in your heart. Notice what he says here in Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. It says, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. And then notice what it says. Don't miss this phrase. Then, then what? Then the God of peace will be with you. He says, when you do this, when you focus on these things, what things is he talking about? He says, when your thoughts are are on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable, when you think about those things, he says, God promises that he'll what? That he'll be with you. So what do I focus on? What do I fix my mind on? See, I, I need to fix it on God, right? I need to focus on him. And then I focus on the promises that he gives to me. You've heard me say this. There are over 3,000 promises in the word of God that God gives to us. And our mind does what? It begins to go towards those things. I think about, you know what? He, he's never going to leave me or forsake me. He said that he'll always be with me. That no matter what goes on in my life, he's going to be there. When I'm lost, he's going to be my guide. That's what he promises me. And so I focus on that. When I'm weak, he is my strength, right? When I don't think I can keep going, he's the one that gives me the ability to be able to do it. When I'm hurting, he's my comfort, right? He says, I'll, I'll be with you and I'll comfort you when you experience pain or when you go through hurt, uh, hurt in your life. And then I ask myself the question, what can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? And Paul actually, in in Romans chapter 8, verse 38, he asked the question. He says, can trouble separate us or hardship or persecution or danger or the sword? Can those things separate us from God? Uh, He says, no, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And we could modernize that today. And we would say something like this. We we could say, shall relational tension keep me from the, the love of Jesus? Shall what? Shall depression or loneliness or anxiety or loss or fear, shall it separate me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus? No, because he loves me and he wants me to focus my mind on him. He wants me to look to him. And so when my mind is fixed on him, he offers to me shalom, shalom, peace on top of peace. 
When my mind is focused on him, he says, Marty, when you focus on me, I'll give you peace. A peace that brings, uh, a peace that, that cannot be understood by the world. John 14, verse 27, peace I leave with you, Jesus said. My peace I give you, I do not give to you as the world gives. So notice what he's saying. He says, the world gives what? The world gives stress and anxiety. The world gives fear. But he says, I will give to you a gift that is far greater than any of those things. If you will focus on me, I will give you peace. My peace I give to you, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. I love what Jesus says here. He says, my peace I give to you. He doesn't say a peace. He doesn't say, hey, I'm going to give you a peace. No, he doesn't say that. He says, my peace I give to you. My peace I give to you. What I have, I want you to have. And in the same way, he wants us to be able to experience that. And that is why what he says to us is this. He says to us, you can experience this peace in your heart and life. And what Isaiah tells us is when you fix your thoughts on God, when you focus on him, that's when he gives you shalom, shalom. That's when you begin to experience it in your life. In Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 to 27, the disciples are in the boat with Jesus. Some of you may remember this story. Uh, they pushed out into the water. There's a big storm that comes up. And in the middle of the storm, something happens. The disciples are afraid for their life. And I believe, as I was reading that this week, there were two specific things that happened. There were two storms that day. The first storm was the outward storm, the one that they could physically see in their life. And that storm was basically the waves and the rain and the wind. And it caused them to be scared. They were fearing that they were going to drown, that the, the, the boat was going to sink. But there was another storm that was going on. And that storm was the storm that was on the inside of each and every one of them. It was a storm of, of life, the storm that they had been experiencing in their own heart. And it caused them to cry out to Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but the storm that's on the inside is the one that oftentimes is the hardest. You see, I can look around and see things happening on the outside. But some of you, you walked in today and nobody knows what's going on inside of here. And the storm that's happening in here, the anxiety and the stress and the fear that you're experiencing is the same thing that happened to the disciples when they cried out to Jesus and said, Jesus, don't you even care? I mean, Jesus stands up in the boat. He, he wakes up. He gets up. And then they're yelling at him. They're, Jesus, don't you care? Can you not see that we're about to sink? This boat's about to go down. And Jesus does something. And I think some of you here today, maybe in your life, there is a storm and you feel exactly the way the disciples felt. You're thinking to yourself, I've been praying and I've been crying out and I'm waiting and I'm listening and I'm looking and I don't see anything going on. And you probably are saying to yourself in your heart, if you're just really honest, God, do you really care? Do you care? And in that moment, when all of that was going on, Jesus stands up and he stretches out his arm and he says, peace, be still. You can't speak what you don't possess. And Jesus possessed peace. And was, that's why he was able to speak the words, peace, be still. Today, he holds out his hand into your life, and he says, if you will fix your thoughts on me, as Isaiah has said, I promise you, shalom, shalom, peace. There'll be a peace that can come into your life and a peace that you can experience. And during the time of Christmas, I think that Jesus wants more than anything else to give you this peace, to give me this peace in our life. Keep in perfect peace those whose minds are are fixed on you, is what he says. You see, for years, I've known this. For years, I believed this. I, I actually, in my heart, believed that I could experience that kind of peace, but I rarely experienced it in my life until I really began to understand this passage of Scripture, that there's training that goes into being able to experience this kind of peace in our life. And it means that 
every time something happens in life, my thoughts immediately have to go to God, not to the problem or the situation or the circumstances that I'm facing in my life. And over the last year, Angela will tell you this, I've worked harder than I've ever worked to try to be at peace in all situations and circumstances. Now, I'm not saying that I get it right every single time, but as soon as something begins to happen, I try to do exactly what Isaiah says, to train my mind, not just occasionally, but every day when I get up, I open God's word and start the day with his word. It's the first thought of every day. And then at night, as I go to bed, I try to have my last thought of the day to be fixed on him so that I can think about what he wants and what he desires. And so throughout the day, I just try to fix my mind on God. God, I'm renewing this idea of renewing my mind and thinking about you and what you want. And I got to tell you, I've had more peace in some of the most difficult circumstances this year that I've experienced than I ever have. Now, it's not because uh, I'm just going, okay, I'm going to have peace in my heart. It's because I'm focusing my attention on God. And as I do, I begin to understand the promises that he's made to me and what he's said in my life. And you see, it's easy to be able to praise him in the storm when you know that you're at peace in your heart because your mind is fixed on him. You're focused on him. Paul writing from a Roman prison at the very end of his life, waiting for persecution, basically. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, I want you to listen to what he says. And we're going to close here in just a second. He says, don't be anxious about anything. Now, just think about that during this holiday season. Don't be anxious about anything. See, whatever it is that's weighing you down... Whatever it is that you walked into today with with, with, that's gripping your heart. He says, don't be anxious about that. But notice what he goes on to say. But in every situation, when a baby's born, when someone passes away, when the doctor's news is good or bad, when a bank account is high or the bank account is low, when marriage is soaring or maybe it's falling apart. He says, in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, Present your request to God. What is he saying? Whatever's weighing you down today, whatever it is that, that, that's heavy in your heart, he says, bring that and present it to God. And then notice what it says. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He says, whatever it is that's weighing you down, bring it to God. Whatever it is that's in your heart today that's heavy, he says, just bring it to him. And God, the God of peace, the God of shalom, shalom, will what? He will transcend all understanding, guard your hearts, and he will keep you in your mind. He will keep you at peace. He will give you this gift of peace if you will focus on him. It's a peace that the world doesn't understand. It's a peace that the world can't give. It's a peace that you can't experience from anything else in life. It's a peace that only God can give. It's from heaven. It's eternal. It's through Christ. And any time we focus on him, we begin to realize that we can have that peace. It's what I said in the very beginning. Peace isn't found in the absence of problems. Peace is found in the presence of God. And what I want for you this Christmas more than anything else is I want you to experience shalom, shalom, the gift that he offers, the gift that he's promised, that if you will not allow your, your, your heart and your mind to be fixed on the things of this world, but that you will allow your heart and mind to be fixed on him, right? That you'll focus on him. He'll give you a peace and a grace in your heart that comes from heaven. May we, this Christmas season, as a congregation, as individuals, fix our thoughts on him. And because of that, may we have shalom, shalom. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that in this world, there are going to be troubles. And I know that every one of us walked in today, and God, there are things in our hearts and in our minds that are burdening burdening us. Some of us walked in today, and God, if we were just honest, our hearts are so heavy because of maybe something that transpired this past week or some pain that we're experiencing or some news that we got from the doctor. 
And Lord, if we were really honest, there's not peace in our hearts because we're focused on the problem rather than focused on you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help each of us to do exactly what Isaiah says. That we would be able to focus our thoughts and our minds upon you. And in doing that, may we experience the shalom shalom that you promise. A peace that surpasses all understanding. And so this Christmas, I pray for your congregation called North Star. I pray that we would experience this peace that you have promised to us as we fix our minds on you. We love you. We thank you for loving us. Go with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people together said, amen. Hey, I'll see you next Sunday as we talk about the next gift that we're offered in Christ. You guys have a wonderful, wonderful week. Shalom, shalom.